Good morning. My name is Alex Pennington, and we are the Aspiring Writers United. Today, I have the privilege of talking with Mark Gottlieb. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be back. Uh, I, I like this, that we do this occasionally. It's kind of nice. Yeah, I just, it, it's fun to talk. And like, I don't know if maybe it's like a weird, not having face to face in COVID, but it's like, I don't know, I think fun to talk book stuff. And <laughs> oh, for sure. And like, just the fact that it seems like every time we talk, there's like something new that's going on in publishing. It's like, you would think like things would just settle down a little bit in, in publishing, but it's like just oh, a uphill ramp. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, people, you know, we talked about this a little bit, but yeah, people are kind of on the, the edge of their seats with um, everything that's been going on in publishing and the world at large. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely exciting times, to <laughs> say the least. So, as inflation just keeps going up and we're looking like we're going into a recession, how is that kind of affecting publishing? How is that kind of affecting book buying? So, you know, that is having an impact, not just on, um, you know, the retail landscape in terms of what customers do, but the state of the economy is going to have an effect on how publishers acquire and publish books. Some, I wouldn't be surprised if some smaller literary agencies, which, you know, any little fluctuation in the marketplace, it's like a a fish population where you change the temperature of the water by a few degrees and you can lose a, a fish population. Um, you know, I think smaller, much smaller agencies and much smaller publishers, it would be difficult for them to weather this kind of storm. Um, but uh, I would say, you know, one of the first and most obvious things that we're going to see, and you're seeing it in, in other ways because the, the Fed is basically raising interest rates right now. You know this yeah. better than I do, given your, your background in accounting. Mm -hmm. but, um, the Fed is raising interest rates to try and slow the economy down. And at the same time, it's, it's driving up uh, the price of everything. Yeah. And uh, what that is doing is um, it could trigger a recession. Um, the last recession did have a profound impact on book publishing. Luckily, our agency actually, we had a great year during the, that recession. Oddly enough, we didn't have to fire anyone. Everyone actually got wow. raises and bonuses. The company happened to do well that year. Even for that again. That's. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, we're, you know, we, we wouldn't want to ever let anyone go or anything like that. We would uh, do everything in our power to keep everyone mm -hmm. together. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so the Fed is doing this to basically sh shrink the economy, slow the economy yeah. a little bit. Um, and they they're basically have been projecting or saying that they're like going to keep raising interest rates mm -hmm. until this stops. And um, I'm forgetting the name of the fellow who's been running the Fed and raising the interest rates. Oh. Um, it'll come back to me. But basically, yeah. you know, his predecessor was you know running the, the fed under reagan and was practicing the same kinds of things and people just for years lived with inflated prices mm -hmm. and eventually you know or hopefully this will will help things but what this is doing basically to the average customer or the average book buyer like people aren't spending as much anymore as really? they otherwise would well because things are more expensive yeah. right yeah like you and i you and i talked about how uh instead of having that expensive date night you know with yeah. the, the restaurant and the broadway show and all that people are probably going to do more like netflix and chill kind mm -hmm. of thing so where this is going to affect book buyers um because um you know books are a luxury item basically and yeah. one of the first things to go you know when the economy is bad usually is people people don't want to give up their essentials they need their essentials the food water medicine and all that the, the things they need mm -hmm. for their day-to-day -day life their car their fuel whatever um but uh luxury items you know are usually the the first to go so yeah 
you won't see people going to, I don't know, the movie theater as much or things like that. And um, oddly enough, people thought that would be the case during the last recession with books, but people did keep buying books. Um, it's just hard to say like in what numbers that will be, um, you know, and exactly how this can look. So, or though maybe people will, will think of books as like a cheaper entertainment option than the Broadway show. Well, that's kind of what I was thinking. Like, I mean, books are in like kind of a weird, a weird area because they're, they're not super expensive. Um, but they're not, I mean, they're not super cheap, but I mean, just for me, like, let's say money tight, I'd probably be more prone to go for paperback for like eight bucks than an $18 hardcover then. Well, that is definitely one choice. I mean, it's one of the reasons why, for instance, in Europe, um, their first format for, for many books, uh, not most or every book and not every country in Europe, mm -hmm. but many publishers do publish in paperback first there. Oh, just because they're used to living a different way overseas, yeah. right? like the cars are smaller. Maybe people have like, you know, one car per family type mm -hmm. thing. You know, it's, it's different over there than here where it's like a consumer kind of culture. Yeah. But yeah, for here, I think you're right. Um, bookstores like Barnes and Noble are going to be saying the publishers we're more likely to carry more copies of this book if you can get it to us in paperback because it's cheaper, it'll sell quicker, we can stock it more easily. Yeah. You know, customers don't have to worry about the higher price tag on a hardcover. They can go for a smaller mm -hmm. price tag on, on paperback or may even drive customers toward other cheap formats like you know, the ebook edition, yeah. things like that. Or like for audiobooks, I mean, you can even get those for free often through a library or something. Yeah, something like that. The audiobooks, you know, are sometimes, um, I think there's like a subscription with Audible where, yep. uh, you know, people might opt for, for that kind of format too. So it could change the ways in which people uh, read. It could change the ways in which they buy books. Um, and so publishers, you know, whereas they may have made plans to, to do a book initially in hardcover, an author might be surprised that a publisher says, no, we need to, to do this in paperback because if Barnes and Noble is saying, hey, we're only taking copies of this if it's in paperback, mm -hmm. then your hands are tied, you know? It seems like, from a, so if that's the case from a publishing standpoint, I would be, I'd be offering a smaller advance then. Or so, I'd be more hesitant yeah. to, yeah. yeah. Publishers are going to be tightening their belts, yeah, in terms of what they offer uh, to authors, um, probably how many books they buy, yeah, uh, and <laughs> how they, how they uh, schedule their payments. So normally, um, publishers would pay, uh, we, or whenever we can, we try and get them to pay half on signing, mm -hmm. half on delivery and acceptance of the manuscript. Okay. And, and now you're going to see more publishers who are wanting to window their payments. So maybe they'll pay in fourths. They'll pay like on signing of, of the agreement, on delivery acceptance of the manuscript, on, you know, maybe, I don't know, initial publication, and then maybe six months after publication or something like that. So they're really trying to stretch that cost out. Yeah, because they want to help their own cash flow. Yeah. You know, it, it takes some of the burden off of the publisher. Um, you know, we're probably going to see more of that. Uh, and, um, and yeah, there, there have already been some imprint closures probably having to do with this. I mean, Holt, there was, I mean, it was a, it was a disagreement, I think, of personalities, a clash of personalities mm -hmm. there. But Holt, which was like a very long-standing imprint at Macmillan, you know, folded recently. Yeah. Oh, wow. And so we might see more smaller imprints get kind of folded up, mm -hmm. um, you know, because these publishers are going to be looking at some of their own costs and things like that. And and yeah. then lastly, I think you know we still you talk you and I talked about this I think on the last show. Mm -hmm. um, the merger is kind of still. Living. That's what I was kind of thinking about. If you have two departments, like those are some easy costs to cut. Yeah, I mean, we have to see what will happen with, yeah, if 
Penguin Random House and Science Institute to merge because yes, they will cut, they will then cut their costs and duplicate departments. And then we have to see how that like compounds everything else that's going on. Yeah. So it seems like, yeah, from that publishing standpoint, you'd be wanting to downsize pretty hard. Well, I mean, they, they, if they want these companies together, you know, mm -hmm. they're gonna, they're gonna reap the benefits in terms of having a really bigger backlist of titles, a bigger yeah. front list of titles, and then not need all the extra staff. So you're right, they would downsize from there. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's not to, I suppose none of this is to tell like scary campfire stories. <laughs> but I think if people uh, like really know what's going on in the mm. world and can understand it for what it is, they can better weather the storm and, um, you know, see why certain things are going on. Like, for instance, I could totally understand why an author would be upset if the publisher initially told them we envision this as a hardcover. And maybe it was even in the contract. Sometimes mm -hmm. you get publishers to put it in the contract that this book is to be a hardcover first. Yeah. And then the, the publisher is getting all this pressure from retailers like Barnes & Noble saying we need a paperback. And maybe they release it simultaneously, both in hardcover and paperback, mm -hmm. which I've seen. Or they just choose to do it as a paperback original. I can understand being upset. You know, as yeah, that'd be a pretty, well, that hit, that hit your royalties pretty hard. Well, yeah, so yeah, definitely from an economic standpoint, the margins for profit are smaller on a paperback mm -hmm. than they are on hardcover. And as you go down in format and cheaper formats and things like that. Um, and then, um, <laughs> you know, I think that uh, there's sort of the, the pride, I guess, for lack of a better word, that goes with yeah. it. Like a hardcover yeah. publication is like sort of what people, yeah, aspire mm -hmm. to. It would be like, I want a theatrical release. I don't want just to go right to streaming or exactly you know, like that. Right to DVD versus actually going into the theater. Right, right. So, <laughs> you know, um, these are sort of all the things that, you know, are at play. It's already, you know, affecting foreign publishing. You know, we're actually gearing up to go to the Frankfurt Book Fair. Oh, wow inflation in some of these other countries is actually worse than it is here. Like, I mean, if you take one mm. of the most extreme cases like Turkey, it's almost like it's 10 times worse there, you know, or a place like England where the cost of living is either much higher. Pretty high um, there. The, 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 the raise in um, interest rates has, you know, strengthened the dollar against foreign currencies. So, mm -hmm. You know, the dollar, I think, has overtaken the euro. Yeah, uh, yeah. It flew right and, past that. And then the pound, which historically, you know, has been stronger than, you know, mm -hmm. the dollar typically. Um, it's like a dollar. I think it's like a dollar six now to the oh, pound. Wow. Um, so that's going to have an impact on mm -hmm. what foreign publishers do when they... Be more expensive to buy U.S. books. Exactly. Because wow. the whole world is is experiencing this. It's not mm -hmm. just unique to the U.S. Yeah, it's um, cause that, and that's what I've seen a lot of companies talking about. It's going to be a worldwide thing, especially shipping companies. They've kind of been scared right now. I know FedEx's stock like halved because of it. Well, that and then a lot of that stuff is also left over from like the pandemic and the supply yeah. chain issues, which we're not 100% clear of yet. Like everyone I talk to who works within the supply mm -hmm. chain or trying to manage the supply chain for different yeah. companies, they all tell me <laughs> that we have at least a couple of years before mm -hmm. um, the, uh, you know, we're really clear of like the supply chain issues and things kind of go back to normal from there. But the way that's, uh, impacting publishers is that they are um, doing more of their printing in the U.S. if they can. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a good example. Um, there's uh, like an art book publisher that made an offer for one of my clients. Now, normally they would do their printing overseas because anytime you have a four color book with a lot of design elements to it, it's easier to print it overseas because the cost is way cheaper. Yeah. So anytime you see a really fancy glossy shiny book <laughs> chances are it was done overseas i mean you could probably afford 
You can open, yeah, yeah. You can open the copyright page. It's going to say either printed in Korea or printed in China, something like that. Um, so what they're now doing is they're toning down some of the elements, design elements and costs and things like that so that oh. they can easily print it here in the US and not face the supply chain issues. But it just won't look quite as nice. Or I mean, it'll look nice, but it'll just be more expensive to make probably. Probably, or, you know, it may look just might look different. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe they do something in like black and white, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to color or things like that. So yeah, it's all this stuff kind of has ripple effects through publishing. Well, it's been kind of like the perfect storm. Cause like, remember whenever they did the stimulus checks a couple, yes. I guess so. So during that time, I'm kind of curious, did your guys' book sales go up? When they were sending around stimulus checks? Yeah. Yes, because when people were at home, they were mm -hmm. they were buying a lot of, yeah. like they, everyone became like a home shopper, basically. Yeah. And they had nowhere, nowhere else to go, nothing else to do. So they were buying a lot mm -hmm. of books early in the pandemic, mainly, you know, large books and classics that they otherwise wouldn't be able to get around to reading. And then, yes, they had trouble getting their books. They had trouble, um, you know, because bookstores were closing or, you know, you could only yeah. run in, pick up your order and leave type thing. You couldn't mm -hmm. really browse. And then when the supply chain issue hit and Amazon prioritized other things, yeah, that, that changed book buying habits um, uh, where people then had to turn to eBooks, turn to audiobooks, And then publishers in turn, were operating at limited capacity, right? They were operating at like maybe 20% of their capacity. So, you know, we might see a similar thing where, you know, this ha just has a general kind of slowdown effect for yeah. publishers. Um, <laughs> you know, we've been pretty, as an agency, we've mm -hmm. been pretty busy. I mean, I myself, I've been averaging probably a, a new book deal every month, which is a lot. Wow, you know, that I is actually, pretty good. Yeah, I do lead the, it's not, it's not to brag or, or toot my own horn. It's just, I think uh, it's good information probably for viewers. And, you mm -hmm. know, um, we, you know, it's good. We, we kept busy. Um, probably, you know, a lot of it might have to do with the fact that, again, if you're a very small agency, like maybe one or two people, you know, like in a home office setting or something like that, you know, and the vast majority of agencies are very small. They're like less yeah. than a dozen people. Again, oh, like wow. that's really stuff, small. It's like going back to the fish that lives in the the pond, and the temperature of the water changes just a few degrees. Mm. It wipes out a fish population. It could be that you know a lot of if agencies are closing their doors, then these authors are leaving and probably moving up the the food chain to bigger agencies like ours. So. Um, you know, it's unfortunate, but like, it's good. There's still a place for authors and all of that. Um, it's hard to say what else will happen. You know, we'll kind of have to like sort of wait and see. There is obviously like other stuff that's looming, like what you and I talked about briefly in terms of, and more so probably in, in the other show about the Penguin Random House Simon and Schuster merger, but, you know, Spotify just entered the streaming audiobook yeah. market. And, um, you know, there are publishers who, foreign publishers who are trying to move into the subscription space. Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of dangerous territory for authors and publishers might really be adamant about doing this kind of stuff because it's a big cost saver for them. Um, it's problematic for, for authors, subscription. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, it usually like, it doesn't benefit the creator, it benefits that company. And it's a, definitely a conflict of interest if a publisher is also like a retailer and a distributor. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're trying to manage subscription services with publishers right now and our agreements with them. Because the last time something like this came about, what happened was, Amazon came along, said to publishers, we want to buy your backlist. We want to turn them into eBooks. Mm -hmm. And publishers went for it. And then when Amazon said, well, now we want the front list, 
the new titles. Oh. Uh, said, sure. And you can release the ebook edition whenever you want. They didn't ever say to Amazon or electronic retailers. Mm -hmm. They didn't window it. It's like when you, when you used to see a movie, you would go to the theater, uh, you would see the movie. Then if you wanted it on like VHS or DVD or now it's Blu-ray or streaming, whatever, uh, you'd have to wait probably yeah. another six to eight months or a year, whatever, mm -hmm. until you could continually get it in cheaper formats. Instead, what publishers did was, oh, we'll release the $25 hardcover at the same time that we release, you know, this cheaper version of the ebook. That's then, not good for the author. <laughs> it's not good for the author, not good for the publisher. It undermined the print yeah. business. It caused like printing plant closures. Um, wow. Yeah. And so, because publishers didn't even give a thought to this. It, they should have windowed. Yeah. They should have said, no, if you want the ebook, you got to mm -hmm. wait until first the hardcover comes out, then the paperback, then the mass market. And lastly, you can get the ebook. Now, publishers just release it at the same time. It makes no sense. I so mean, if I'm looking at a screen, like I have $25 hardcover, $2.99, you know, ebook, and it's like, Oh, and not just that, you can get the ebook instantaneously. You don't have to drive to the store or yeah. wait for the book to come in the mail. Boom, it's there. Right. So, you know, and then when publishers realized this was a problem, that they're selling these, you know, whatever they were, $2.99, oh. $4.99 ebooks against $25 hardcovers, mm -hmm. then the publishers said, Oh, well, we're just going to jack up the price of ebooks. But then the customer expectation oh. was already set differently, right? Yeah. Nobody's going to buy the $10 ebook. Right. So it, it basically made for a disaster for the industry because Amazon became like a behemoth, definitely in, in electronic retail and, and, in, and in people where they go to buy a lot of their stuff. Um, the uh, Penguin Roundhouse probably had to merge as a result. Uh, it had just like profound effects on the industry, basically. And um, I mean, it's what led to the, the agency, you know, pricing scandal among uh, book publishers in that um, publishers were trying to set their own prices in an agency model. Oh. Basically, they say to the retailer, this is what the book is going to have to cost if mm -hmm. you're selling it. It's not up to the retailer. Wow. And, but they colluded, you know, with, with Steve Jobs' help. And so, That's right. yeah, yeah, all the publishers were made answerable for that, along with Apple. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, <laughs> my point, now this is happening again, in a way, with subscription services. Because yeah. if publishers are blasé about this, mm -hmm. and they just say to some a behemoth company like Spotify, like, sure, or, or Amazon, like, sure, you can do a, a subscription model and yeah, we don't really care like what you want to pay or that, or you can actually do the subscription at the same time, the hardcover and the ebook are coming out. That's going to destroy sales. Yeah. The same thing will happen again. Yeah. I mean, how does the author even make money on streaming service? Like if it's, if I'm paying like eight ninety nine or 10 bucks to get like any ebook or, you know, however, it's like, how did the author even make money on those? Because they're not getting sales revenue. So my understanding of it is that basically for participant, it, it, it's different, obviously, the structure and like the, probably the percentages, you know, paid mm -hmm. uh, is different for every uh, retailer. But from what I understand, at least on the music side from Spotify, is that there's sort of like a pool of royalties. And then- okay. Yeah, basically, once your song gets streamed, you know, you you feed from that kind of pool of royalties. So interesting. Your book huh. could just sit in a program. Yeah. And no one ever listen to it or read it, and then you won't really feed into that huh. royalties until someone like at least maybe buys or reads or samples a portion mm -hmm. of your book, and then. Um, I think some of that pool of royalties is not just generated by the subscriptions themselves, but also uh, ad revenue because they have like, that you know, free versions. <laughs> um, but still, this could prove like a disaster for authors, especially mm -hmm. if it's not handled properly. So 
that's why we're really pushing back on this on subscription services in our you know contracts with publishers because there's sort of this sort of you know there's this big wait and see like how that all plays out yeah did you hear about so speaking of amazon did you hear about their big um uproar with the writers guild that happened last week um no fill me in on, on that so, again so in terms of ebooks there's a policy that if you have not gotten to a hundred percent of the ebook you could hmm. return it for a complete refund yes i yes i remember now and yeah they were it, i guess like every that became trending and yeah, so that got totally abused oh they're doing returns on on ebooks and yeah they want they were measuring stuff in terms of page reads and percentages of books yeah. read and then that determining the factors of how people are are paid um you know it's a problem because before ebooks you know if you bought a book mm -hmm. and you didn't want it you had to return it yeah and or if a book was bought and return, you know, it could live in other places. It could live in libraries. It could live in a exactly. used bookstore. It could live in a new bookstore. You could resell um, that. It could be resold. Now with eBooks, like mm -hmm. they're being, well, they're obviously, this has been going on for a while, but yeah, they get pirated. They get downloaded. Mm -hmm. They get transferred. Um, there's a library lending program. Um, Kindle, I, you know, they have a Kindle uh, library lending program and then Overdrive. Yeah, Overdrive's the big one. So basically it's like, you know, a library in the past <laughs> when they wanted to stock a certain book, mm -hmm. they would have to buy, you know, a certain number of copies of that book. Yeah. And it was either checked out or not. It was either available or not. Mm -hmm. Now they buy like a certain number of the, the ebook, you know, and they like kind of lend, lend that out. And it becomes like, it's kind of precarious, like what, you know, you're, you're describing yeah. in terms of paying people based on page reads. Part of the problem is also that like Amazon is a really big company, mm -hmm. you know, it's, they flip a switch because they want to like try a little experiment uh. and then lives just hang in the balance you know <laughs> it's like that movie clash of the titans with yeah. playing with human chess pieces or whatever like you know it's you know it has a really profound <laughs> effect on people yeah think, no and just but like basically what people were doing is like on tiktok and everything you know, they'd get to the 99 percent point of the book so it's like you know the back or it'll be like you know publishing information stuff Mm -hmm. And then they push return and they'd get their right. money back. And there, there's quite a few big, fa like famous authors. And they were all just coming after Amazon and like, but it took them months to do anything. Um, like, man, that would suck having to return all that. Honestly. I mean, you know, and part of the, the other problem is um, just sort of the origin of all this, like, yeah. Return, you and I may have talked about this in another show, but returns at bookstores, part of the reason why that came about in the first place mm -hmm. was during um, the depression, you know, it used to be that most of the things you, you bought, it was a final sale. You couldn't return things. Yeah. And the government wanted to help the cash flow <laughs> among consumers, not really considering manufacturers and not mm -hmm. really considering retailers but basically they allowed for returns you know yeah. it helped the publishing industry in a way because it made it easier on, on on the retailer that they any excess stock they could return to the book publisher and then publishers had to figure out what to do with those extra books they had to either sell it somewhere else sometimes cheaper otherwise their warehousing costs go up and oh, they yeah. had they um, publishers would uh, oftentimes, unfortunately, have to pulp these books. What do you mean by that? Destroy them. Oh wow! Because there's nowhere every wow. you think about it. You have you have books sitting on a pallet in a warehouse, yeah. space. You know, yeah, it's not going to work out for hundreds of titles. 
Yeah, so sometimes an author will get a letter that says, you know, we're pulping X number of copies of your book. Would you like to buy them at very deep discount? And then they just get destroyed. It's terrible. Wow. Yeah, I mean, think about That's, it. That'd be horrible. It's How like the author. It? I mean, if I'd take my books. I mean, sell them yourself or something. Yeah, and like Barnes & Noble, you know, anything, any stock they take that they don't have to sell, like yeah. they can just return to the publisher. Mm -hmm. So it puts puts pressure on the author, puts pressure on the publisher because book publishers typically hold what's called a reserve against returns. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, so they... Um, you know, it's usually a small amount of money and it's like a, a percentage of whatever they they printed or spent on the book. But, you know, it's it's a reserve against returns just to, to help prevent against really high like return mm -hmm. costs. And then eventually they release the reserve. Yeah. You know, the author and royalties. It's just held for like, you know, a royalty period or so, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, it, it's um, having that in place limits how much the publisher can print. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the publisher like loves a book, but they don't want to oversell it to a retailer because yeah. if they oversell it and they print too many copies and they put too many copies in the bookstore and the retailer can't sell all of them, mm -hmm. then the publisher gets saddled with all these books that get returned to them. Couldn't there, I mean, like if your option is to destroy the books, I mean, couldn't you sell them for some price to like a half price books or like i mean well, it seems like not, somebody yeah. would be willing to take these books no that does happen i mean eventually yeah. the books get discounted priced down yeah put into other places but you know there's still going to be excess stock yeah true and you know for it to just sit there like unless the most publishers on most on most books they 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 print they want to have at least higher than 50% sell through, sell through, mm -hmm. you know, if it's a situation where it's like a lot less than that, then again, like your books, when you make them, it's not just the cost of, of manufacturing. You also have shipping costs. Yeah, oh yeah. You have uh, the warehousing costs. So like, mm -hmm. it's not just one author and one pallet of books sitting on a, a shelf in a, in a, warehouse like you're not talking about just hundreds of books you're talking about thousands of authors tens of thousands of books <laughs> and warehouse is filled with books yeah wow. basically dang so how you know knowing what the kind of the economic forecast is like and everything let's say you're going to meet with a publisher to negotiate a deal how do you do that like what is your kind of I mean, obviously your goal is to get, you know, the most money for the author and you know that, hey, the publisher is probably going to be wanting these things. Is there like anything you're like, I won't say willing to give up, but like, what do you negotiate with? Um, well, first we look at the offer that the publisher were to make, you know, <laughs> and, you know, I don't know if the publisher is really, you know, these are, these are probably larger economic factors external factors that are affecting sort of the, the world or like the landscape of publishing um they do probably play a role i think in like negotiating a book deal with a publisher okay um you know certainly if the publisher mentioned like subscription services for mm -hmm. instance um in a negotiation we would say like look can we um sort of freeze that or put a pin in it yeah. in such a way that it's in the agreement, but it has to be negotiated in good faith if it were to come mm -hmm. up. Or we might try something like, will the author have the option of, if the book doesn't meet a minimum sales threshold in a subscription service, that the author has the option to pull their book out of the subscription service. And then the other thing too, with the subscription services is that some of these publishers get price incentives and to basically paid to to join yeah the ways. and the authors don't really see that money or really yeah, that doesn't flow that through money. so but it should they should like mm -hmm. look think about it let's say you're scribner the imprint at um simon and schuster yeah. that publishes stephen king mm -hmm. and spotify really really wants your books why because yeah. stephen king is there 
Now, Scribner gets incentivi incentivized to join the streaming program, mm -hmm. but then the only way Stephen King sees money is like in the the, the revenue, the, the royalties, you know, that spill off from the subscription, which that's basically what the subscriptions really benefit. These small mm -hmm. authors or up and coming unheard of authors or even mid-list authors aren't gonna be making the kinds of money that, like for instance, you open Spotify, you're probably playing like the Beatles or Rolling Stones, yeah. like big name the, bands. The big not, guys. Right, and so, but then Stephen King, you know, he is the value add for the publisher. Mm -hmm. um, it's he's not going to see a piece of whatever Spotify paid or incentivized the publisher uh. if were to to join. It just gets eaten up by the publisher. So that kind of thing should be in contracts between authors and their publishers. That if we are to join a subscription service, mm -hmm. we, we get to see a piece of whatever the whether it be in advance or whatever the subs subscription service provider is paying to the publisher because, hey, it, it, I'm Stephen King. You got picked up by I, Spotify. I am the product here. I'm, I'm the real reason they want you guys. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that's sort of one of the, the things too we've been trying you know, with uh, publishers and putting their, um, you know, in mentioning subscriptions and things like that. Um, you know, in terms of the windowing of payments and deals with publishers in, in uh, uh, when, uh, uh, you know, we tend to let stuff like that go because it's the same amount of money. Yeah. It's just paid over a period of time. <laughs> yeah. Unless the author, you know, wants to be paid much mm -hmm. quicker or up front. Sometimes they want to be paid in different ways for tax purposes. Yeah. You know, better to be paid in, in a certain year than another or mm -hmm. one way and then another. Um, but usually, you know, there, there are more important deal points in the contract than just when the money gets paid. Like I would much prefer they pay more money yeah. over, over a period of time, a longer period of time than less money over a shorter period of time, right? True. Yeah. So those are some of the things like we let go of typically in a negotiation, unless it matters to the client or something like that, because there are more important things to get in the deal, in the contract, you know. What is like, what, what, what is one of the most important things you think? Would it be like the hardcover versus paperback or? Well, I mean, in the, the most important thing in the deal, there's the book advance. Um, mm -hmm. We talked about the payout schedule, yeah. um, the royalties. So the structure of the royalties, how they're paid and the amounts, mm -hmm. the sub rights, this basically the subsidiary rights and their splits. So like if a book is published in Braille, if it's a book club edition, you know, a yeah. first serial, stuff like that. Um, and, uh, you know, you, the delivery date for the manuscript, the publication or proposed publication, mm -hmm. you know, because these are going to all factor into the, the agreement. And then, yes, yeah, sometimes we, we put it in the initial deal, the initial format of the book. Um, but like we talked about before, like it can get reductive if you begin to, like, a, let's say again, Barnes and Noble, if this happened, you know, I saw this happen during the pandemic, Barnes and Noble wanted a lot of paperbacks. They didn't yeah. want hard covers. Like it's going to be reductive if you argue with the publisher at that point and say, I don't care. Tell Barnes and Noble they're taking hard covers. Mm. It's not going to you know, not budge. Do whatever they want. Yeah. You, mm. at that point you, you have like, you basically have no choice. Like it would be counterintuitive to, you know, kind of go against it at that point. Um, I don't expect people to be happy about it, but you yeah. know. Um, do you think bargain? So like, let's say they, they say that they only want mostly paperbacks. I mean, if they're, if they're saying that being realistic that, Hey guys, people probably aren't going to be buying much hardbacks. I mean, that could kind of be good for the author because like you don't want to then put out a bunch of hardcovers that don't sell. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then the publisher experiences returns, you know, which you, no one wants. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. It could in a way benefit the author. And if you, and even though the margins for profit on a paperback are smaller, if you sell <laughs> more, more of them, you know, the, the profits begin to look better. Mm-hmm. You know, the other thing I'm seeing is a lot of publishers now 
of being very conservative in the way in which they buy books. So whereas in the past you could sell, you know, sometimes, sometimes you could sell fiction off of a proposal, like a sample. Oh yeah. Sample chapters, or maybe a synopsis or a detailed outline. That's like a James Breakwell. That's kind of how he does that often, I think. Well, I think with, well, that mm, he may, no. So with his recent, yes and no. So with his recent publisher, he sold it off of a sample because it was basically option material. But I'm talking about like an author who hasn't worked with a publisher before, a certain okay. publisher, like let's say James Breakwell went to a different book publisher. Mm -hmm who's not as familiar with him and his writing, they would probably want more from him than just the, you know, the uh, uh, option material in terms of like just the sample chapters and the synopsis. They would want to see the full manuscript. So the more and book, more yeah. Are, yeah, putting pressure on authors to see full manuscripts. Um, I think if you're Stephen King, that would be different because you could probably <laughs> write a book idea on a napkin and sell it. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah, I think for for the vast majority of authors, yes. Um, publishers are going to really, really be insisting on full manuscripts. And um, so that 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 can be tough because uh, you basically have to, at that point, it's like you're auditioning, really. Yeah. Uh, but not just auditioning. It's like, I'm going to perform the entire three act play for you. Not just this one scene. Mm. You know? Oh yeah. I want to do this all for you, please. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. Um, that, so, you know, um, what else did we uh, think about talking about during the show? Cause you know, I know something you know, some... interesting about Stephen King. I don't know if you know this. Um, he covers all of his book production costs. Have you heard of that? He covers his own book production costs? He does. So what he did was that basically in exchange for a, a much higher royalty rate, he actually covers the making of his books. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, gets... It's hard to say maybe what that looks like, but he basically like is a publishing partner, I guess. Yeah. I'm sure. And then his, his revenue may, you know, look differently. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what, if that affects what he takes up front. It's less. He takes less up front. I mean, I imagine he's just going off of sheer volume of sales. Because right. like, you know, to Stephen King, he's going to get hundreds of sales in the book sales. So yeah. Less money up front and just, yeah. Yeah. So basically one of the reasons why, so it's like sometimes people are like, Geez, why are, why is the ebook royalty only like 25% of net? Why is hardcover sometimes only like 12, 15, 18 percent of net or whatever? Um, because publishers have big upfront costs yeah. in terms of what they're paying in a book advance, mm -hmm. uh, their own production costs, like some of the things we talked about, the shipping, warehousing, manufacturing costs, all of their overhead costs. So I suppose in that business model. And it's easier to do, I think, if you're Stephen King and you uh, know, you can't not all authors can do that. That's yeah. more just like a Stephen King thing. <laughs> it's a you're probably taking it's puts a lot of individual risk mm -hmm. yeah. on the author because you in not knowing how your books are going to sell, like you know, um if it were a flop of the complete flop, then you'd be in trouble because you, you would have trouble. had a big upfront advance. Mm -hmm. You would have at that point help the publisher with the production costs and all that but um for stephen king he's probably taking way less up front mm -hmm. in exchange for a revenue share with the, the publisher yeah and it's really really hard for most authors to be in business that way unless again it's a surefire thing <laughs> like if you're james patterson if you're stephen king and you want to do something with revenue share model mm -hmm. you know okay. You're living off that advance. <laughs> yeah, you're probably, you can probably take that kind of risk. Mm -hmm. uh, but for most people, that's very hard to do. Um, what, what happens if like a publisher gives you a big advance and you do flop? Like, are you actually expect, you're not expected to pay that money back, are you? No, no. So a book advance is, is basically risk money that the publisher yeah. puts up. And you never have to repay the book advance unless, let's say you 
the contract gets canceled or, or you don't mm -hmm. deliver the manuscript, that kind of thing. Um, you know, if the publisher defaults, you get to keep the advance, you know, like yeah. let's say the publisher doesn't live up to their obligations mm -hmm. in the contract, um, like serious, serious violations of the contract, like maybe they don't publish the book on time or whatever. <laughs> um, the, um, but the advance, basically, you want to sell through your advance. Everyone yeah. wants to get to the point where the book is selling so well that you effectively earn your advance back in the number yeah. of copies sold. And that's when you begin making money on the back end in royalties. You said that they're not wanting to do sequels and series as much. Is that kind of what they're thinking about? Like, if we're not going to be able to sell through this advance, how can we invest into another book by them? I'm glad you mentioned that because, yes, whereas in the past, publishers used to really invest in an author in a series like mm -hmm. supposedly Terry Pratchett's Discworld series. <laughs> it wasn't until like something ridiculous, like the seventh book into the series that it really took off. But publishers were like believing in him, investing in him in this long run <gasps> series. Like whereas 14, now, 15? <laughs> oh, yeah, there are a lot of them. I mean, it's a whole world unto itself. But um, the uh, now publishers are wanting to do standalone titles oftentimes, or if they buy a series, they don't go all in. They buy like the first two books maybe because um, they want to wait and see how it does. Yeah. If the first book doesn't do well, <laughs> we'll see how maybe the second one does. Mm -hmm. you know? With the standalones, they figure, well, if the standalone title does well, it can always be built out into yeah. a series. Um, you know, they would want to replicate that success, but it puts less risk on the publisher where let's say they bought two standalone titles. God forbid the first one didn't do well. Well, yeah. we have an opportunity with the second one, but at least we're not locked mm -hmm. into a series. It's like you, once you agree to a series, you can't go back on it. But if you buy the standalone, you can always kind of branch out. Well, with some of my clients, I mean, now... You, you have to be ready to kind of like pivot in a lot of things because oh. um, let's say a publisher bought the first two books in the series mm -hmm. and the first book didn't do well. At that point, I would go back to the publisher and say, look, this second book on the contract, you know, we don't know if the series will take off with the second book. Can we swap in a different title? Like, can we do a standalone oh, title and see that's how that's a good idea. Go? And then every time there's a two book contract with clients, I always, when the author is close to either delivering the, 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 the last book on the contract mm -hmm. or has delivered the last book on the contract. We try to re-up, do a new deal with the book publisher because having more books under contract are more opportunities for the author. Yeah. I'll give you a good example. I had an author who we did a two book contract. Um, the, the first book did, did okay. Uh, we weren't sure how the second mm -hmm. book was going to do. It wasn't looking good. But we, before the publisher had any sales numbers to go off of or any of that, we, we got a, a second book under contract, a second okay. two book deal under contract. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, what happened? The first book did well. The second book, you know, took a dip. Yeah. But at that point, we had an opportunity to do two more books with the publisher. So the third book, you know, on the, that's on, mm. on the other contract, right? It did well. So it was like the author's huh. career, like did this, but then she came up again. Came back up. And then this, we did, we replicated the same thing. We did another two book contract with the publisher before that second book on, on that second contract mm. could deliver and publish, took another dip. But then again, it was the same thing. We came had, back up came back up because we we had two more books under contract and that book did well it it saved that author like more than once so um <laughs> you have to be creative in terms of how you do this but publishers love to push back against that sometimes they put it in the contract that you know we won't consider option material you know for a new book from you mm -hmm. uh, until some of them really try until maybe four months after publication because they want to wait wow. and see how the book you know those does. sales numbers yeah and they want to look at the pre-order numbers they want to look at numbers in the wake of its publication mm -hmm. to get a sense of then do we really want to buy another book so we <laughs> you know, kind of i mean i do like to bet on success but in hedging our bets a little bit you yeah know, it's good to try to 
get another book under contract with a publisher before they can make an objective business decision in terms of the sales numbers, better to do it when they can only make a subjective decision. Uh -huh. We love this author. We love their book. The early reviews coming in are great. We, we don't know what the pre-order numbers are <laughs> or the sales numbers, but I don't know. We love the book enough to want to buy two more. When, when the sales portrait is realized, and if it's not a good portrait, then that's when it's harder. Yeah. And it's like the more books you have out, the more chances you have for success. It's like if you have two books out versus six books out, well, if you have one or two that do good, I'll probably raise the numbers of everything else up a little bit too. Oh yeah, it's like spreading chips across, you know, yeah. the the um, you know roulette or or something like that. You know, if you can get to a point where you have multiple publishers, I mean, big mm. publishers and different publications with them, that's another way to kind of spread your chips far and wide. And yeah, having multiple books under contract, you know, at any given time um, does increase the chances. I mean, it, we're having to ramp up our efforts, you know, at Trident just because of, you know, where I work, Trident Media Group, just because of our, um, you know, the economic conditions we're asking. Yeah employees there to be doing more book deals to mm -hmm. really be pushing back on publishers you know that kind of thing and in turn you know authors need to to be yeah ideally i think if you're writing commercial fiction regardless of economic conditions you want to be putting out a new book every 12 to 18 months anyway yeah just to kind of keep the audience and all that engaged and Oh God, it, it doesn't seem like I probably remember the fails. Like if you're a publishing house, it's like maybe you do have a dip here, but it's like, as soon as you get that up, it's like, do they really remember the misses that much? If you have five books out? Well, they're probably more forgiving if they're looking at the overall sales numbers, but most yeah. book publishers tend to look at primarily the, la the sales <laughs> numbers on the last book or two. So like- okay. Yeah, a lot of authors, unfortunately, will get dropped by a publisher if their last book didn't sell well. Publishers aren't as forgiving. But if the one prior to that did and they go mm -hmm. to another publisher, sometimes the other publisher will take the view that, well, we saw a dip in their sales, but it could improve. You yeah. Know? Um, but that's why, again, it's always better to be just re-upping the agreements mm -hmm. before the last book is delivering, uh, you know, um, and, before, and before that book then goes on to get published um you kind of better your chances that way what is a, so it's something i've kind of been researching a bit so let's say i'm having a book come out what is the number of sales that you shoot for for it to be like a good like a, a good release like is there like a target number probably most book publishers would be happy with any book that sold anywhere from 10 to fifteen thousand copies 15 thousand but even with that in mind it depends how much they paid for the book and like what all yeah. the costs were. Like, let's say they, they paid a lot and they printed a ton of copies Yeah. and it only sold a small amount, then they're not happy. Mm. If the sell through was high, you know, then they're, they're happier. A mega success. I mean, I mean, at publishers, you basically, you kind of have a few different groupings of titles. You kind of have these lead titles that the publisher does. So those books are going to have huge printings like, maybe 150,000 copy first printing, something like that. Right. You know, outside of that, you have kind of key titles, which, you know, they might have larger printings like in the tens of 20, tens <laughs> of thousands, something like mm -hmm. that could be more. And then you have kind of these make titles, which kind of have to make a name for themselves. And, and those are going to have much smaller printings, like, you know, probably, you know, under 20,000. So, um, yeah, I, you, you have to, the, the book has to just affect, it has to earn its advance back or at least yeah. be close to, the publisher's got to be close to breaking even to be kind of happy with how a book did. They need to be making that profit on it. Yeah. Which, I mean, I, hey, I can't blame them for that. Like, <laughs> hard, to, hard to stay in business if you're not making a profit on every book you sell. Definitely. I mean, the other thing we're going to see is, you know, depending on what happens, um, 
you know, the sell through and all that, mm -hmm. you know, typically a book that went into other formats, like was initially published in hardcover, mm -hmm. but then made its way into paperback. Yeah. That was not just simply a, a random choice on mm -hmm. the part of the publisher. The book sold well enough in hardcover that it justified the publisher doing a printing in paperback yeah. oftentimes. So you, we might, just given the economic conditions and depending on um, that impact on publishing, we might see a lot of instances where a book lit, lived in hardcover for a mm -hmm. time and didn't make its way into paperback. Yeah, do not quite sell enough to, to make that conversion over. Yeah, or, you know, it might be the opposite. We might be seeing, again, publishers doing the paperback first mm -hmm. or releasing multiple formats at the same time so that people have like a cheaper option. So have to see how, how all this stuff works out. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Yes, likewise. Thanks for having me here. It's always wonderful speaking with you. And you have a class coming up in October. Uh, that's right. So uh, there's this website, writingworkshops.com. And I usually stop by there once a month. I do a workshop on a different topic that I think are, are helpful to authors. Mm -hmm. Um, so this one coming up is about the book to film and TV space, um, kind of how to meld your work to that, the needs of that marketplace or what goes on in that space. So I think it could be, it could be good for authors, uh, it could be interesting. Uh, and then following that, uh, the next month I'm doing a, a workshop on, um, uh, the audiobook space and the foreign rights space. So basically getting your book. Mm -hmm. Turn it into an audiobook or getting it translated and published overseas and what goes into that. Awesome. I'll um have a link below where people can sign up. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much again for joining me.